Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Anda sedang menonton Agar Na'wani dan malam ini kita masih membicarakan tentang taufan haiyan yang telah mengakibatkan hampir 4,000 nyawa yang terpun hilang di Filipina dan puluhan ribu lagi yang menjadi mangsa uh, terjejas kehidupan mereka malah dikatakan kalau dipikirkan secara lebih meluas uh, berjuta kanak-kanak yang terkesan. Oleh itu saya ingin meminta izin untuk berbicara dalam bahasa Inggeris. I would like to welcome Miss Vivina Belmonte, the UNICEF head for Malaysia. Thank you so much for making time. And uh, I was just making my introduction that says that about 4,000 lives have been lost. But uh, if we look at the bigger scope millions of young children or young people has been involved affected one way or the other directly or indirectly uh, by by this uh, disaster so UNICEF have always been looking at young people yes. and their welfare and their interests but maybe this time around all those experiences network and power has to be directed to one particular area looking at one particular aspect which is relief for disaster too many times the normal get overlooked in times of disaster mm -hmm. the weakest link will get forgotten because everybody will be seen as a weak link for example so what is the mindset of approach to go into a disaster area like in Takloban but just taking that layer where young people are affected first and foremost mm -hmm. Well, you, you showed at the beginning of the segment these devastating images of, of what has happened there. And if you can just think that this happened overnight. So for people who are there, uh, even though they're used to typhoons, it was the 20th typhoon to hit mm -hmm. the Philippines this year. This was just devastating. It was on a scale unlike others. People who've been to emergencies, to many emergencies like this before, say this one is of a different category. Mm -hmm. It's so strong. For children, our experience at UNICEF is that when emergencies hit, they hurt children most. They are mo more mm -hmm. vulnerable. They get separated from their families, from their parents easily. And the trauma of seeing the world you know turn into the world that mm -hmm. those images showed is really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Overnight, no food, no light, no electricity, no communications with the outside world. For a child, it's... What do we need to do? We need to make sure to get to them, to make sure to find parents if they've been um, separated from them, make sure they have clean water, food, shelter. And then, a s strangely enough, when you see those pictures, we also say we need to get them back into a, in as normal a routine as possible. Mm -hmm. And the way we do it is we start with makeshift school shelters. We, we opened one today. We have 12 more opening in the next few days. Mm -hmm. And it's allowing children, the one thing they, they know in their normal life before the typhoon is they go to school every mm -hmm. day, they go home every mm -hmm. day. Reconnecting with something that looks like a routine in the middle of the chaos is critical. If we look at it, um in a lot of people's minds sometimes in these parts of the world, uh, we are not like some other continent where we see uh, disasters, man-made or otherwise, every now and then. So when we mention UN, United Nations, and United Nations are already there in, in Takloban, so a lot of people might be thinking, and that's it, they're getting help, you know, the people there. But I've been to Aceh on the third or fourth day after the tsunami. Yes, the UN was there. Yes, the US Army was there. But the disaster was so huge that any one or one more pair of hands can help save a lot more lives. You know, some are still trapped under buildings that nobody can do anything about because it's shopping complex inundated with water and nobody can reach, for example. So. The thinking sometimes is that the moment big names, big organizations are in, then things will be solved. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe every single help in any which way that comes should or must be given because even if physically in certain areas things are okay, then there's this psycho-emotional aspect to think about. So I mean, especially it comes to children, one is trying to put back missing children back to their family but the other is those who have already found their family will still need to be addressed absolutely that's why these 
emergency shelters, these evacuation, the evacuation shelters that, that have been set up are so critical. It's giving families that, that are still together, intact, a, a safe place to be. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and in the first days, and this happened a, a week and a, about nine days ago now, in the first days, the most important thing in, a, in a, an emergency of this size, you went to Aceh, you know exactly what it's like. Access, just being able to get, what, the one challenge is getting the supplies into Takloban, mm -hmm. into an airport that was mm -hmm. also affected. We fixed the airport, getting it into Takloban and then getting it oh. to people um, from mm -hmm. the airport. Um, what, what's always interesting for, f for us, what we know our challenge is, is it's great when we are able to distribute. Mm -hmm. If people are, th are at the airport mm -hmm. and we distribute, or if we can manage to go mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. roads that have been full of debris and we've cleared mm -hmm. them and we can mm -hmm. distribute. We go to evacuation centers and we distribute. That's great, but that means that we're, we're getting to people who are able-bodied. Yeah generally. Mm -hmm. Now think about um, children who may not be with parents, people who are disabled, older people as well. They can't rush up to an airport gate and mm -hmm. sort of fight among mm -hmm. other people to try and have access to some of those supplies. So it's really thinking very quickly on your feet and with the supplies that are coming in, let's get it to those who are in the front line, but don't forget the ones who are, who mm -hmm. are behind as mm -hmm. well. because. Mm -hmm they're going to have trouble mm -hmm. going to the front of the line and getting the help. Mm -hmm. I was lucky that a few months ago I was in New York and had the opportunity to go into the United Nations building. And I met a Malaysian there who works as a computer programmer. And he was telling me how the big data approach. And I have to go for the first break, but once we are back, I think information is one of the most crucial aspects of any relief effort. Because you need to know what's happening, you need to know where people are, families, individuals, whether they're separated. Some people are trying to find some family members. Actually, it's on the other side of, of, of the area. And if only information can be collated and put strategically, even to disperse, you know, food stuff or blankets, it's always that the help will come to a center then from there it needs to go out. Okay, but exactly. where does it go? Mm. That needs to be strategic because we might be over uh, giving them to some place, but some other places has not been having clean water for maybe since the disaster. So how do you look at information as a strategic uh, network in a relief effort, especially for children? Because the longer they are separated from their families or people that they know, the worse the impact emotionally and mentally on them it will be. And I've found uh, in Aceh that they're not even coherent, you know, even the locals can't get to them because they just close their mind because it's their defensive way of handling the harsh reality of disaster. Maybe we can talk about that after this because I'm sure UNICEF has a lot of stories to tell that has been collected from the disaster area. That after this short break. Thank you for still watching a special episode of uh, Again Aoni with UNICEF of Malaysia. And um, we're looking at disaster relief and we're looking at the case of uh, Typhoon Haiyan and we're looking at Takloban and even now they're still needing help. So especially when you look at, uh, because in normal times we expect children to be well looked after, but what do we do in disaster time? So information strategically especially for children i think is very very crucial because even now i'm sure there's a lot of parents still looking for their missing child or child looking for their missing parents or relatives information saves lives in situations like this yes people need clean water yes people need um, food and, and nutrition and housing and shelter all of those things are absolutely mm -hmm. vital but the information, the kind of information you're talking about also has an impact. Um, I, I saw a photograph today of sit, City Hall, el electricity has been restored to okay. the City Hall in Takloban, yeah. and there are hundreds of people lined up there 
so that they can recharge their mobile mm -hmm. phones. Okay. They've been out of communications Understood. contact with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And being able to uh, SMS, text, call, receive calls and texts just to say, mm -hmm. yes, we're okay, um, is fundamental just to, uh, to, to the community. And I think it's crucial to build up the ability of the affected community to help themselves because too many times you know people like to give and give and give but uh, if it's, it's like pouring uh, water on stone if a stone is immovable then the stone cannot help itself so in order for the community to be helped the most it's got to be a two-way street so yeah. in that case the mental and, and emotional impact I think sometimes very much underestimated for disaster relief yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I mean, um, one of the things that we're really concerned about is the trauma that children have, bon have gone through. But it's also the trauma that their parents have yes. gone through. They've all mm -hmm. survived Suffer. this nightmare. And in, in the first days, um, we, were, we were hearing from some of our colleagues in Tacloban mm -hmm. saying, people are just wandering around. They don't know where they're yes. going, they're just wandering around. And that's trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you just, you're looking for what what used to be your yes. house, what used to be your neighborhood, mm -hmm. and you're just seeing a new reality yep. that is yours. Mm -hmm. I also want to address, you, you, you make a very good point about how, how we help. Um, we get a lot of calls. I mean, Malaysians are very, very generous in, in situations like this. They see these mm -hmm. dramatic photos yes. and, and they call us and they say, how can we help? And a lot of people want to, um, give either used clothes or canned foods mm -hmm. and things like that. And what we try to explain is that actually giving money is better. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's better is that, uh, one, it's very expensive to ship items mm -hmm. into an area yeah. like that. Um, and it makes those items, mm -hmm. even though they're yours and you've yeah. paid for them, more costly. Mm -hmm. Two, it undercuts whatever the economy is in the place where, where we're at. Yeah. People there are struggling because of the, media, mm -hmm. the immediate effect. Mm -hmm. But for them to get back on their feet, they need to be able to start re yeah. re reopening businesses when they can. And uh, we've had time and time again instances where people say, people in a disaster hit area say, mm -hmm. stop sending us stuff because mm -hmm. that undercuts our ability mm -hmm. to get back on our feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's sort of hard to explain because one is a, a response that yes. is more thought through and the other one is the very ge generous and genuine. I, I think awareness must go a bit higher on that because even in Banda Aceh we were looking at old clothes thrown all over the street adding more chaos actually in, <laughs> in terms of physical appearance of the area because people just don't want it and and you know, so it's not just physical you know they can survive they can find clothes but um, to them it's also about pride sometimes you know they want to have their own and it's not fitting to their culture sometimes you know we just give whatever so making it finesse I think in mm. helping uh, and maybe it's the easiest thing to do because if, if I saw a disaster area somewhere and I just just give away this, you know. But um, I think Malaysia can be a bit more generous in being a bit more strategic mm. in helping. So yes, cash is one thing, but, but maybe they also want to volunteer. And how do they volunteer to UNICEF or any UN organization for disaster hit area like Takloban? Well, in, in situations like this, particularly in the heat of an emergency, we, we actually um, don't take on volunteers. Mm -hmm. we, we don't. Um, and the reason we don't is that there, is really technic there are technical skills okay. that are needed. Right. right now, uh, the kinds of people that we're sending in mm -hmm. are people who have experience with setting up water sanitation systems okay. again so that mm -hmm. water clean and water is available. so that w clean water is available for drinking bathing cooking because mm -hmm. diseases that's where they start if mm -hmm. you don't have clean water mm -hmm. the risk of disease goes up mm -hmm. exponentially mm -hmm. um, we we send in uh, nut nutrition people we send in um, people who are experienced at child protection mm -hmm. so to mm -hmm. deal with mm -hmm. tr trauma and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing so there are specific skills you know when, again, when you, you look at the pictures, the people that we send in, we realize that we're taking up space as yes. well, and we're taking and up food, and mm -hmm. we're taking up water. Mm -hmm. so and energy. 
Right, and we're taking up space on the streets that are already yeah. clogged. So we're well aware of that. Uh, we have um, someone from our team, UNICEF Malaysia, that's mm -hmm. in Takloban right now, and, and we text back and forth, and he says, you know, I, I just met somebody who walked 12 kilometers mm -hmm. to, tr to go from one area to the next, just trying to get back to a hotel. Mm -hmm. the, there's no public transport. There yeah. aren't cars. Yeah. The cars have been mm -hmm. thrown away yes. in, in, by the 300 mm -hmm. kilometer winds. Now you're really starting from a very mm -hmm. primitive yes. position and you're trying to ramp it you're up very quickly. You're facing the same problem that the victims of the typhoon themselves are facing right now. Right. So how, how do we make that better? Because duplication sometimes happen mm -hmm. because a lot of NGOs want to go and they want to help. Good intentions, but like you said, we must be very, very strategic in what we do down there because we don't want to impose our presence that takes up more stuff that they already don't have, for example. So maybe corporations, and I notice that also more and more corporations are coming into the picture. They, I, I just finished World Innovation Forum for three straight days in KLCC Convention Center, and there are also innovations regarding clean water, you know, how to provide clean water in difficult areas. And this technology, this technical expertise and know-how, could be shared with a body like UNICEF and that then can be streamlined straight to Takloban for example. Let's open that up for the last block that we have and maybe you know innovative creative thinking to help because intentions are good. We respect that and thank you Malaysians for that but how do we make the most impactful contribution is what we're going to talk about after this short Great. break. Thank you for still watching a special session with UNICEF Malaysia on Agenda Awani with Ms. Vivina Belmonte. Uh, and um, sometimes duplication reigns in disaster area because a lot of NGOs start flying in and even individual volunteers or group of volunteers, everyone buddy wanting to do good. But I think in Malaysia, if we can somehow organize ourselves here before we go there, mm. talk to almost every unit or every organization or every individual, every group that wants to go and collate among ourselves and then select the best needed to fit what's needed over there. That would be the ideal scenario. So even corporations like said, you know, I know one company, we've done the discussion on that for World Innovation Forum, that they have uh, mobile units to provide clean water, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how can corporations or groups of NGOs or NGOs or individuals work together with UNICEF, for example, to help, you know, be more strategic in giving help? Well, there's, there's that kind of conversation that happens in the heat of the action now, and, it, and it's also a good conversation to have before the yes, emergency time happens. To time. Uh, time and time again, when emergencies of this scale happen, one of the biggest challenges is access. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you get the help that's being sent in to the people who mm -hmm. need it? That's number one. The other, the other one that comes up uh, quickly is coordination. Mm -hmm. All of this, uh, we saw this in Haiti. So many things yes. coming from so many mm -hmm. places. How do you make sure that you're not tripling up yes. and sending three times help to this one family mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. here and this family over mm -hmm. here doesn't get it? And the coordination yeah. is critical. Mm -hmm. and the, one of the worst things that we can do is to take the take the donations that we get, take the help that we get, mm -hmm. and not distribute it as widely and as mm -hmm. well as possible. And that's a co that's a coordination effort. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's always a challenge, and we know that the, the situations like this are complex, and it, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. things things are moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. And you you learn to to respond in mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. um, but coming up as well, I mean, there's a lot of work that's done pre-emergencies okay. with mm -hmm. the UN system, with other uh, organizations that help in emergencies, mm -hmm. with governments themselves. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. the the Philippine government is very yes. active right mm -hmm. now in in mm -hmm. in this. They're not mm -hmm. just they're not a recipient. They're an active yes. Yes. Uh, part of the aid mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. um, and there are discussions that go on throughout and innovations that that the kind that you were referring to that help in a really isolated uh, situation mm -hmm. to get clean water those kinds of things are great mm -hmm. for 
um, coming up with yes. life-saving mm -hmm. help. Because it has no power, so a hand pump, for example, to get clean water from, from deep down is, is one of the things that's very priceless. And I know that from my experience in Nache. But moving forward, sometimes, you know, media is also part of, of uh, the whole scheme of things. And people will get sanitized because they look at it every day. And this is typhoon, this is a picture of disaster area. But I like talking to the United Nations and its uh, members or you know, executives, people on ground, because they always have people's stories. And, and these are the things that will always make us be on our toes. Because you know you can't just know Taklobad, you've got to know who lives in Taklobad. At least mm. one name, one person. I will forever remember this 19-year-old mm. lady about 250 kilometers south of Banda Aceh, 5,000 houses in that village. None remain standing, none at all. It's not even a single pillar. And, and she was there, and she was the only one who survived. And she lost about 25 immediate and extended mm. family members. So, stories on ground from Takloban, so that Malaysians can always remember that, to be always generous and to be more strategic in helping, if you can share with us. Yeah, I, th I think in the UNICEF team in Takloban has been really moved by, by the story of a, of a young woman, 20, 22 years old, who um, had a baby one week before the, um, before the typhoon hit. And she managed to hang on to this little girl. Mm -hmm. So Gwendolyn managed mm -hmm. to hang on to her daughter. And for her, the light, uh, as, as dark as, as it is, mm -hmm. as, as horrible as that emergency was, she, and she lost family, mm -hmm. but she has her daughter. And, and for her, her purpose is, I want to make sure that my daughter has a, has a sound future. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it looks like right now. Mm -hmm. She was in one of these evacuation centers yes. in one of the churches, and we We'd been to that evacuation center to give um, hygiene kits to, yes. the, to families. Mm -hmm. And so just with basics, just you know, with, a, with a plastic bucket that mm -hmm. had soap and, and toothpaste and uh, sarong and just basics, for her it was, I have my, I have my little girl, mm -hmm. I look around me, I know a lot don't anymore. Mm -hmm. This is the future, this is the future of my family, mm -hmm. my community, mm -hmm. my country. And I know that that little girl really touched the hearts of, of many. One thing that I always take away from a disaster and relief effort is the astounding human spirit to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. The triumphant inner strength that always come out. Of course, there are those who suffered and can never recover, but there are those also who pick up whatever is left and move on. And I'm sure this is the experience and the takeaway yeah. that we must always, always acknowledge and move forward with. You know, we're, we're often asked, people uh, like UNICEF who go to these emergencies time and time and time again, how can you do it? And I can tell that you've been to one because that's, that's exactly mm -hmm. the answer. Mm -hmm. It's that even in this horror, you see people who, st who of courage, people of strength, people who have every reason to just sort of sit down and say, that's it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And yet they stand up, they, they want to help themselves. Yes. They're, they're, they're not only, you know, they're not mm -hmm. waiting for handouts. Yes. They want to help the, themselves. They want to rebuild. They mm -hmm. want to rebuild their families. And it's that strength and that courage and that resilience that there's no way that somebody who's visiting yes. the emergency can can ever be pessimistic yes. in, in, the, in mm. front of that optimism. So keep the help coming. It's still needed, right? Indeed, Sometimes we tend to think that it's over, <laughs> but it's not just because we don't see it. Thank you so much. Thank so you. We'll, you can see on screen how you can help or how you can get in contact. And uh, we'll keep on discussing issues like this. And maybe it's good to discuss this pre. You know, we know that the climate of the world is becoming more erratic in certain areas, a certain kind of situation. So we've got to prepare, even though Malaysia is blessed, but the ability to be aware of what's around us is very key for us to help when the disaster struck. Thank you so much for watching. Hantarkan pandangan anda sendiri pada semua mekanisme yang ada untuk berhubung dengan Astro Awani sama ada di internet mahupun dengan aplikasi mudah alih Astro Awani di iOS dan juga Android. Jumpa lagi dalam episod yang lain pula. Sekian, selamat malam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cameron. Pleasure.